my talk will be about uh, a computational approach towards early detection of micropollutants in rivers. It is based on a project that we started this year. On um, uh, it, the, the project is called the Swain project, but I will come to that a little bit later. So I'm the international coordinator of this Swain project. <clears throat> So my agenda for today, uh, I will start with a little bit introduction to the topic of micropollutants and uh, their impacts or effects on the environment. Um, then I will very briefly talk about uh, the project, how, uh, the organizational stuff and who is involved, which universities and countries are involved. Then the main part of my talk will be uh, on uh, part three will be on challenges that we have in this project and uh, solutions that we uh, envision or already started implementing. And just to give you an overview of what we are doing at the University of Vienna, but also internationally. And then I will conclude my presentation, hopefully on time. So let's start with the introduction. So many industrial facilities are located in watersheds. A watershed, if you uh, don't know the definition, is the area of land that drains or uh, sheds water into a specific water body. And in our case, it's a river. And uh, these industrial facilities are located near the rivers, rivers for a specific reason, because they use uh, substantial amounts of water for various purposes in their process. It could be used for fabrication, processing, washing, dilution, cooling, or transportation. So, um, of course, after they use the water, they should have a, a water tra treatment process and uh, to ensure that the pollutants generated by these industrial processes are removed or at least minimized uh, in the water that is discharged back to the river. And a typical water treatment plant looks like this. And um, of course, uh, there is a very high risk of water contamination if a certain water treatment plant is ineffective or simply it fails. Uh, and this could be due to an accident at the industrial facility. And based on historical experience, we saw that these uh, failures are unfortunately not rare. And these water treatment process plants are prone to failures. Just to give you a few examples, um, here we see uh, new from a Finnish newspaper about uh, a disaster in 2014 in Kokemaki River in Finland. Um, in this case, 66 tons of nickel was, was released from a factory uh, to the Kokemaki River and uh, raw process waters were discharged freely for 30 hours before anyone has noticed. It. So there was a long period of time then that the pollution continued. And this was the biggest nickel contamination in Finnish waters in, his, uh, in history. Or more recently, uh, in Poland, uh, there was a failure of a water treatment plant in Warsaw, which resulted in 260,000 uh, 260, cubic meters of wastewater uh, being discharged into the Vistula River for five days without being noticed or uh, being able to uh, stop. And Poland Ministry of Environment described this event as an environmental disaster and a big threat to, to human health. And later analysis have shown that 300 tons of nitrogen and 30 tons of phosphorus were, was released to the river. And uh, we see this uh, news article here. Um, so um, the, another example comes from Turkey. And in this case, there was a, 
uh, effort to clean a river, actually, uh, Ergene River in uh, Turkey's Trace region. And this effort uh, called the Ergene Deep Sea Discharge Project began pumping uh, water from the Ergene River uh, to the Marmara Sea to, in an attempt to clean the river. But this resulted in something even worse, which we see here in the left side picture, that uh, a thick layer of so-called marine mucilage, or it is sometimes called sea snot or sea slime, covered nearly all of the Marmara Sea. And uh, the, the reason for, for this is uh, rapidly reproducing algae uh, in nutrient-rich water. It was nutrient-rich because uh, polluted water from the Ergene River was pumped to the sea. And also uh, another reason, reason accelerating the uh, algae reproduction was uh, climate change because the sea temperature was higher than normal. So uh, these uh, very recent three examples, uh, we argue that are not uh, just uh, just rare events, but uh, in the future there is a high risk, uh, especially in northern parts of the world, uh, of such accidents because also again related to the climate change, uh, the permafrost, as you know, is towing and causing significant su su structural damage to the facilities in these areas, for example, in Nordic countries, Russia and Canada because the, the ground is getting weakened and uh, the facilities are being affected. In Ju June, 2020, uh, a diesel storage tank near uh, Norilsk, Russia uh, has sunk and uh, 17,000 tons of oil uh, reached to do the Ambarnaya River, which uh, is shown here uh, with the red, the diesel was uh, polluting the river. So uh, in this work, we have uh, two use cases that we focused on, and these are exactly two of the disaster, two of the rivers that the disasters uh, that I have just introduced have happened. Uh, the first one is the Ergene River in northwestern Turkey, as you see here. This is the trace region of, region of Turkey in the border between Greece and Bulgaria. And um, this river um, has widespread industrial development shown with red dots in this figure in the upstream. And, uh, and uh, when a water treatment plant is, fails, there, there could be uh, an, an environmental impact, especially also a health impact, especially because this river, after the industrial facilities, flows through uh, agricultural areas shown in yellow here. Uh, this part is one of the uh, most widely uh, areas used for agriculture in Turkey. And then the, the same river reaches the, uh, the Maritsa River, which is the border between Turkey and Greece, and then finally reaches uh, where this arrow shows to the agency. So it can also affect the uh, environment there or the um, yeah, marine life there. And the, the project that I also mentioned was a canal between this Argene River to the Marmara Sea, which caused the disaster in the Marmara Sea. And the, the second use case is where this nickel disaster happened in Finland. It is Kokemaki River in southwestern Finland. And this also poses a health risk in addition to the environmental risk because the, uh, the city of Turku consumes artificial groundwater originating from that river and uh, any pollution in that river would then result in uh, tap water in Turku basically. And um, timing is very critical in these kind of disasters uh, because pollution from the river upstream can travel to the water intake, for example, in this Kokemaki case, 
from 20 minutes to one hour, depending on how fast the, the river is flowing at that time of the year. And um, that's why we have to detect any kind of pollution in the river in, in the matter of minutes. But in the examples that I give you before, it was 30 hours in one case and five days in another case. So it's uh, not that easy to de detect the, the pollution. Then um, we are focusing on a specific kind of pollution, pollutants, which are called micropollutants. Um, so I will give you very brief uh, information about micropollutants, but of course I am not an environmental scientist or chemist, so I'm also still learning about them. But what I have learned is um, they, um, they come from extensive use of chemicals in our daily lives, such as personal care products, household chemicals, and so on. And these, um, then many, many studies uh, confirm that these uh, chemicals are uh, present in the river uh, more than expected. And they, they, they confirmed the occurrence of hundreds of chemicals in surface water around the world. And these chemicals are called micropollutants because they, are, uh, they have very low concentration in the river. For example, it is few micro or nanograms per liter. Uh, however, even in, in, in that very low concentration, they pose significant risks because they are uh, highly toxic, endocrine disrupting, carcinogenic, mutagenic, they contribute to the antibiotic resistance and they are also tolerant to decay. So they stay in the water for a long time. Of course, this is something uh, very negative about the environment, this tolerance to decay. But for our cause, when we, um, when we try to detect pollution is re in river, this could be a benefit because uh, even in the downstream part of the river, we can detect uh, these micropollutants, which can be a good indicator of pollution in the upstream river. So uh, they can be a good indicators of pollution uh, and a, a good way to locate the source of the pollution, which we are trying to do in this project. So the problem we are addressing is that uh, currently there is no a water quality management system that can identify and recognize different micropollutants in watersheds, uh, not in real time. So of course there are techniques to detect them, but not in real time. Basically to detect micropollutants, uh, scientists take samples from the water, go to their laboratory. There is a, a machine, large machine for analysis. They use it and after Several minutes, uh, I, th I think around 20 minutes, they got the results. And this is only for detection. And also there is not much work for locating the sources. So detecting is one thing, but then when you detect it in one point, then you also need to know the source of it so that you can um, prevent it or send a signal to this specific facility in the river. So this is currently not possible. And therefore there is an urgent need for uh, quick decision-making methods to identify pollution sources and react before water quality is affected irreversibly. And uh, our hypothesis is that if we combine different information such as um, real-time uh, measurements, uh, static information such as river bathymetry and so on, or um, and periodic micropollutant measurements, because we cannot have continuous micropollutant measurements, but we can have periodic ones. Um, we can then uh, infer the distribution of micropollutants in the river using uh, artificial intelligence techniques. And using this uh, model, we can uh, infer the dis uh, distribution of certain micropollutants and locate the source of the pollution. So this was our hypothesis in the beginning of the project. And uh, it basically means uh, from certain available data, we can predict uh, more information 
that that is that would be available if we had the whole uh, available data. But I will come to this data limitations a little bit later. So uh, the sec for the second part of my talk, I will talk. Uh, I will very briefly introduce you the Swain project. So this is the main concept drawing of the project. So the idea is, um, as I said before, there are micropollutant sources on the river, and we will build some measurement stations around the river, which will continuously collect data from the river. And uh, this data will be transferred to a, some kind of uh, processing facility. Uh, here, it, it is not important where it is located. It could be here, it is called an edge server, a cloud server. I will explain these stuff later, but some kind of processing facility where it is analyzed. And uh, if some micropollutants are predicted with their sources, then these, this information is sent to the authorities, then these authorities have the responsibility of sending a warning signal to the uh, industrial facility that is causing the pollution. So we complete the circle uh, with a warning signal uh, here. And the, the main idea is even if we cannot prevent accidents, and if the accidents will anyway happen, even if they are rare, then at least we can detect and locate these accidents within minutes, uh, instead of uh, as the disasters that I explained to you in several hours or days later. And if we can be that quick in detecting the pollution, then the, uh, this kind of environmental disasters can be avoided. So uh, the project, Swain, is an abbreviation for sustainable watershed management through IoT-driven artificial intelligence. And it is uh, funded by the Chistera uh, program of the European Union. And uh, this Chistera program has uh, specific topics every year. In 2019, the topic, one of the two topics was novel computational approaches for, for environmental sustainability. And our project was uh, accepted by, by this uh, call. And the project is uh, funded by uh, four national research agencies. Uh, so FWF in uh, Austria, Academy of Finland, Swiss National Science Foundation, and Tubitak in Turkey. So we have partners from four countries and the, our total funding is uh, about 1 million euros. And as I said, the project started this year in March and it will continue for three years. Our partners in this project are, first of all, they are interdisciplinary. We have environmental scientists and computer scientists working together on that. So the environmental scientists are coming from the SUKE, which is the Finnish Environmental Institute. And they bring the use case of Kokemaki River in somewhere here in Finland. And the second uh, group of environmental scientists come from Turkey, uh, Boğaziçi University and Istanbul Technical University. And they bring the use case of Ergene River, which is located in this part of Turkey. And then the, the computer scientist partners are um, in Austria, University of Vienna, which is leading this project, and uh, also Technical University, uh, Vienna University of Technology as well. And uh, from Switzerland, we have Università della Svizzera Italiana, uh, who are also computer scientists. So we choose these two rivers, Kokemaki and Ergene, for a uh, again specific reason because uh, they they show great variety of uh, different climates, very cold climate here and a warm one in here. And um, also they are more manageable, smaller rivers that we can build our prototype systems and then we can uh, deploy it for the European wide uh, early warning system. So uh, it, it would not make sense to start with huge rivers like Danube or Elbe. Uh, from the beginning. <clears throat> so this was the end of part two. Now, as I said, 
I will just give you an overview of the, what we are working on in, in a format of uh, introducing the challenges and our initial solutions for, for these challenges. Of course, these solutions are not the only solutions. There could be different approaches to the same problems, but yeah, this is what we, uh, what we are doing. So um, I tried to categorize uh, these challenges into different classes. So in the first class of uh, challenges, we have uh, collecting continuous data in a sustainable and efficient way. So uh, in, order, in order to make decisions in, in minutes, we have to collect data also in minutes or even seconds. Uh, not, not to lose any information. So we need continuous data that feeds our artificial intelligence model. And for this continuous data, we need to uh, design the sensing e equipment. We need to uh, place these sensors on the river, uh, pre-process data, um, then supply these monitoring stations with electricity because they are not, they are in very remote areas uh, and there, there might not be uh, utilities there. And then doing in an energy, uh, energy efficient way. And uh, also we have to minimize the fingerprints on environment when we are deploying this kind of sensors in the environment. So we have to minimize the number of sensors as well. We cannot just, go ahead and uh, put uh, disposable sensors all around, and all around the environment. Uh, and finally, we also need to deploy a communication network for uh, to be able to collect data from these sensors. So let's go through these uh, challenges now, one by one. The first one was the how to design the sensors. And uh, a submersive water quality sensor looks something like this. And it's, it is usually connected to a handheld machine that reads the, uh, or logs the information. The one that you see here is a, a submersive fluorescence and turbi turbidity sensor. And um, to log the data, uh, we, we will integrate it with a single board computer called uh, Raspberry Pi here. It is the size of your palm, basically, very, very small size of computer, but it is quite powerful. It is as powerful as a um, standard smartphone or even, even a laptop, not a high-end laptop maybe, but uh, in a standard laptop like it has eight gigabytes of memory and uh, for a quad core, 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 core uh, processor and but what most important for us is that it is very energy efficient because uh, usually um, the energy consumption of computers come from the cooling parts and in this case it doesn't produce much energy and it doesn't have any cooling so uh, it is very energy efficient, and that's why we can uh, we can somehow find in enough uh, electricity power to to support it. But I will come to that again later. Then, uh, when we design our sensors, the second question is how to place them. So, um, where to find good locations for sensor that that gives us the, the most information. So in this figure, you see the uh, distribution of sensors from our preliminary work. Uh, for now, you can ignore the gateways, but we are focusing on the sensors. We, we make this decision based on historical data. So um, in previous years, environmental scientists went to these uh, river locations and collected samples from them. And by analyzing these samples, we can tell them uh, which locations are critical for uh, having a continuous uh, data collection. So placing our sensors. And in this, in this work, we try to maximize the information collected, but minimize the number of sensors because then it will have an impact on the environment itself, the sensors. 
And um, then we, and so a very simple solution to it would be, why not we put one sensor to the end of the river, which can cover the whole river. Uh, yeah, but this of course does not work because then um, all the pollution from all branches of the river combine to a single branch. And if you make your analysis there, then these substances can have uh, can make chemical reactions in between and form compounds. Then you lose the information uh, that would be valuable for you to to locate the source of the pollution. That's why you have to have um, more sensors around the river. Then uh, it comes to the pre-processing of the data. So in our case, um, we would like to, so uh, I will first introduce to you the, the, the concept of edge computing, which basically means local processing of data because in traditional computation, um, data is generally processed at the cloud. So we have large data centers and for cooling reasons, they are usually in, uh, for example, in Nordic countries because it is then easier to cool them and they benefit from economies of scale. They, they have thousands of servers, thousands of uh, computers in a single uh, locations and all the, um, they, they are, suitable for traditional applications where data is distributed from a single location to the all users around the world. So this was the case in uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago, all applications were like this. Uh, we had websites to, uh, where, where they were hosted in cloud data center and people were accessing them from all around the world. But now, the, the data is not coming from a single location, but the data is coming from all of us, all our smart devices, variables produce data. And this data has to be processed somehow. For example, when you speak to your personal assistant uh, on your mobile phone, it has to detect what you are saying. So this processing part uh, cannot be done anymore in a cloud data center because of various reasons. And the most important reason is latency, because uh, if you transfer large amounts of data to a, a faraway location, there will be some network latency and some applications are very sensitive to it. For example, uh, a virtual reality application or augmented reality application has to do com computations very quickly because it is changing immediately you, when you are wearing a VR. AR um, headset immediately when you change your uh, direction and look to another way, it, ha it has to update itself. That's why latency is very critical in this, in this kind of application. Also in, for example, traffic monitoring, uh, where we take the videos of the traffic and make uh, optimization based on that. It also uh, has to be done very quickly. And for these kind of applications, as I said, uh, processing in the cloud is no more possible. And here comes uh, into the picture edge computing as an alternative to cloud computing, where the data processing is not in a single location, but distributed all around the world so that the, the data is proce uh, uh, processed where it is produced where, or close to where it is produced. So in this kind of uh, architecture, as I said, the, the main motivation would be latency, but there could be other motivations. For example, it could be privacy. So if for, consider a smart home application where collect, which collects a lot of personal data and you may not want it to send this data to a cloud for processing instead, uh, if there is some local computer in your smart home and if it does the processing at your home, you would be, uh, your pr privacy would be protected. And in our case, the, the reason is neither. So when we monitor the, the river, we don't need to have decision in a couple of milliseconds, but uh, we can tolerate some kind of delay 
because this delay is always in, in, in the scale of seconds or even milliseconds. So it is not that time sensitive. It's also not related to privacy because we don't collect any personal data, only um, environmental monitoring. But in our case, um, we need also edge computing, which means distributed processing of data because um, we are in a very remote environment. That's why um, we, it's not possible to continuously transfer collected data to a cloud data center. That's why we have to process the data locally. And when we pre-process data, usually the, the size of the data is decreased uh, significantly, and then it is more feasible to transfer it to somewhere. Then the next point is, um, or next challenge is energy harvesting. And again, because we are in a very remote environment, there, there is not uh, electrical utility. And we have to supply these monitoring stations or sensors with electricity because they will do the processing and they will also do the sensing. All of these things needs certain amount of energy. As I said, uh, these, these small computers are very energy efficient, but still we need uh, some kind of energy, which we resort to energy harvesting. And energy harvesting means uh, that energy is derived from external sources for small uh, wireless autonomous devices. For example, uh, wearable devices or wireless sensor networks. In, in the most basic case, you can think of your automatic watch for which uses the kinetic energy when the wearer uh, moves their arm. So it uh, uses this energy to, to run the watch. And currently, for example, it is not sufficient for running a mobile phone. It's not that uh, uh, efficient yet, but for our applications, which are very energy efficient, we, we saw that we could use solar energy uh, so there are different ways of doing it. It could be mechanical energy, uh, for example, coming from movement, as I give in the watch example, or it could be uh, waves in a sea or flow of the river, or it could be thermodynamic energy because of uh, changing temperature, or it could be electromagnetic energy due to magnetism or uh, solar power. And in, in our case, uh, two possibilities are using the river flow to generate energy and, of, of course, solar power for generating the energy. So if we come back to this placement problem, then it is obvious that we also have to consider um, energy uh, generation when choosing good locations for the sensors because there should be uh, continuous sun uh, or the river flow should be uh, strong enough in the locations so that uh, sufficient energy is generated, which complicates the problem a little bit more. <clears throat> then the next challenge would be the communication. So these sensors can collect the data and pre-process the data, but at the end, they have to uh, communicate somehow. Either they send their data or send their decisions to somewhere so that we know they detected something. And um, in the areas we are deploying our system, there is no cellular connectivity, neither 3G or 4G, not, not 5G, definitely. And, um, and even if these kind of cellular connectivity was available, it typically consumes too much energy uh, to, to use these kind of uh, networking uh, protocols. And we cannot also use Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi range is typically um, 100 meters. And we are trying to cover, cover an area uh, consisting of um, an area of tens of kilometers. And uh, if, if, if we cover a real uh, large river, then hundreds of kilometers, of course, but in our prototypes, tens of kilometers. So what we do is use um, a network protocol called LoRaWAN, which is used for long range and low power communication. 
So this module that you see here is a module for uh, the small computers that uh, has an antenna that can communicate with a gateway. So this is the network gateway that will be also in the environment so that the data from the uh, collected data can be transferred to there. And this protocol, this LoRaWAN protocol, runs in, um, in using line of sight. So these gateway and the sensor should be in the same line of sight. So if there are any obstacles in between, like a forest or a hill, then this will, um, this will result in uh, worse quality of communication. And to increase the quality of communication, we would have to increase the signal power. And then this would mean, this would mean that um, you would use a si stronger signal, then we will consume higher energy, and uh, yeah, and this is something we want to avoid. And we again consider the sensor placement here. The problem is now gets even more complicated because then you have to choose locations where the communication would be efficient. So you cannot choose um, a gateway and a sensor to communicate if there is a hill in between them or if, or if there are uh, many trees in between them. So uh, then the sensor placement problem becomes uh, even, even more complex. And currently we are working on this. So I will now move to the second class of problems, which focus on learning the pollutant distribution in the river. So the, the machine learning part of the problem. The first part of the problem is about the sensors and this part is about machine learning. And by the way, I use the word artificial intelligence and machine learning interchangeably. Normally there is a difference between them. Machine learning is a subclass of artificial intelligence, but uh, it doesn't matter for our purpose. So I use the same term and for learning this pollutant distribution, there are also uh, different problems because as I said before, we cannot directly measure micropollutants, but we can measure other parameters that could be associated with micropollutants. And this is a task for artificial intelligence. Then we have to cope with the, the problem of data scarcity. There are two kinds of data scarcity that I will talk about. Then uh, we have to update our model continuously and we have to integrate expert knowledge to our method. Expert knowledge in this case is the knowledge coming from the environmental scientists. And uh, there are also problems about resource allocation. So uh, the first problem is addressing the mismatch between what we measure and what we want to measure, which is micropollutants. So uh, I hope this gray out part is visible here. Um, so here um, we will develop a micropollutant source detection model, which means it will uh, take the distribution of micropollutants and based on this distribution, it will detect the source of the pollution. And then it will uh, communicate this source to, to an early warning system. Uh, but for this model to work, as I said, it needs measurements, micropollutant measurements or the distribution of micropollutants. So in an ideal world, which is unfortunately infeasible, we would have many sensors all around the river which can detect micropollutants. So it will tell us this is the distribution of micropollutants and we will be able to make our prediction based on this distribution. Unfortunately, this is Current technology doesn't allow this. So what we do is have a uh, machine learning model of micropollutant distribution using other data. It is not that important what th that data is to make predictions about the distribution. So based on these predictions, our model will predict the uh, source of pollution. And uh, to do this, to associate these measurements to the micropollutants, we use a technology called graph neural networks. 
And basically, I will not go into the details of it. The, the basic idea is that it's as an output, it gives you a graph that uh, shows you the association between different variables. In this example shown here, uh, it's a graph neural network output that shows the association between the nouns in a given text with the adjectives and verbs. For example, uh, the, the adjective largest is uh, frequently used with encyclo encyclopedias, largest encyclopedias in this specific test. Uh, in, in this specific text. And the same idea can be applied to our case where we can find out the association between the measurements and the uh, micropolitans. Then the other problem would be the data scarcity. As I said, there are two types of it. Spatial means we can collect data only from few locations, but we want to know about the whole river. So we have to generalize our collected data to the whole river, and we cannot do it by simple interpolation. We have to uh, use more intelligence method for that. And the second types of data scarcity is temporal, because uh, in environmental sciences, the data, environmental data, is usually collected in very coarse granularity. Like um, every, uh, in the best case, the data we have is every hour, or in worst case, every day. So daily measurements or hourly measurements. In, however, we need um, we need data in much more finer granularity in terms of minutes or seconds. And this is another challenge we are targeting. I will not uh, talk about the solution we have, uh, which is kind of uh, too complex to, to explain in, in the limited time I have, but uh, this is a problem we are targeting at the moment. Then uh, two problems that I will briefly mention are uh, lifelong, lifelong adaptation and expert knowledge integration. So lifelong adaptation means uh, our models should adapt themselves continuously in against changes. So what changes can be in environmental river monitoring? Uh, there could be new industrial development in the river. Some facilities may close, some new ones can come. Or the process might change, then it brings new uh, concentrate new uh, types of micropollutants, or there could be seasonal changes or even abrupt changes in the river flow because of climate change and so on. So uh, our model has to adapt itself uh, to this and we will use data-driven lifelong uh, learning techniques for adapting our methods. And the second uh, the second one is expert knowledge uh, integration. And this is about, um, so we, we cannot only rely on data-driven approaches, only based on data, because, when, because the data can be inconclusive. And even if the data is conclusive, there can be noise in the data. So our... Uh, our inference based on the data might be wrong. And that's why this data-driven approach has to be combined with an expert-based approach. And experts here are humans, uh, environmental scientists. So we are looking for, for a way to combine information coming uh, from data and from humans uh, to, to find a more accurate model. And there is a technique called expert elicitation, which is uh, about which is about transforming uh, expert knowledge into probability distributions, and we can then use these probability distributions in combination with our um, AI model. So um, I will skip this one and move to the third and final class of challenges. Uh, I will not give into much detail of this because this is the last part of the project and we haven't started working on this yet. Uh, but our promise is in this project is also 
uh, derive um, or design and develop a decision support tool for micropollutant early warning. So there will be a probably web-based tool for public, but also for, op uh, for uh, stakeholders or authorities where they can visualize the output of our pollution model. And uh, this tool will adapt the visualization based on the specific context and needs of the user of this tool. And we will ensure that uh, all stakeholders and policymakers can use these tools effectively. And particularly, we will find ways of visualizing uncertainty because uh, by nature, the methods that we use are probabilistic. So there is no guarantee that the results are 100% correct. There is, a, um, there is a range of failure and we have to show it to the policymakers so that they, they can make the decisions. Finally, I, before concluding my presentation, I will talk a little bit about the uh, wider impact of our project. So what we will improve. So um, currently uh, locating the source of the pollution uh, is only possible for uh, very small distances, less than 10 kilometers. And our aim is to study real, real river systems uh, with, with our techniques, which can cover hundreds of kilometers. So this, this is the first uh, significant improvement. Other improvement is that we want to make the decision within 15 minutes. So once an accident happens, our system will detect it and locate it within 15 minutes. And currently, uh, only the chemical analysis takes 20 minutes. And as I said before, there is no automatic way of doing it. Someone goes there, manually takes a sample and analyzes in the lab. And uh, we have to automize all this process. And yeah, and in the previous uh, disasters that I introduced, um, a lot of micropollutants reached the river because they continued for uh, days. And in, if, if we can stop it in 15 minutes, this would be a huge improvement. And finally, another improvement can be made in the number of micropollutant or substances detected. Currently, the water policy directive of the European Parliament identifies uh, 45 substances uh, as priority ones or high risk ones. Our aim is to cover all these 45, but in total, we will cover up to 100 micropollutants. And so our long-term vision would be an, an European-wide deployment of AI-based micropollutant detection systems, and uh, which will cover hopefully most of the rivers in Europe so that uh, future, uh, future environmental disasters in river can be uh, prevented. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you for, very much for your attention.